and welcome to the debut episode slash reboot of the AVA Movement Podcast. My name is Adam Barnard, and for this show's maiden voyage, I'll be joined by longtime Angels and Airways fan and AVA Movement moderator Stephen Christie. Stephen is someone who I've known for quite a few years through the AVA Movement forums, and when I approached John Marco, who runs the AVA Movement, with the idea of rebooting the podcast for this new Angels and Airwaves era, Stephen was one of the first people who came to mind to co-host. As a musician and fellow AVA enthusiast, I'm excited to have him with me to introduce the podcast as well as discuss the band's new single and music video, Rebel Girl. But before we dive into the main discussion topics, I just want to throw it over to you, Stephen. How you doing, man? Yeah, I'm doing good. Thanks for uh, having me on this. Uh, it's quite humbling, to be honest. I didn't expect to be on a, any sort of podcast. This is cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been, I mean, unless I'm mistaken, you've been around for pretty much since the beginning of the AVA movement, I know I came around or I discovered the AVA movement right about, right after Love had come out, right after Love Part 2 and Neighborhoods had come out. And, you know, as the band was transitioning and starting to demo uh, the Dreamwalker and you were already there. I know that for sure. And I think you were there for a couple years, even before I, I came on board. Yeah, I, uh, maybe, maybe a year, maybe a year or two. I think I joined around 2011, I think. It's been such a long time. <laughs> and at the time, I mean, I'm sure not a lot of people know this, the AVA movement uh, organization or the entity that is the AVA movement was not a just a Facebook group. I mean, Facebook groups weren't quite as sophisticated as they are now. And it, right. it wasn't an Instagram page because Instagram still really wasn't a big thing in 2011. So the AVA movement was actually an online forum. It was its own website that you had to register for and post on AVA specific message boards. Um, right now the, the group, I think it was about 2015, right after the Dreamwalker, uh, Jean Marco turned or transitioned the AVA movement into something that's more of a social media entity. And I've been completely flabbergasted and, and, you know, delightfully surprised at how much it's taken off because, you know, the, there's thousands of people, like 20,000 people on, on, uh, the Instagram or 15,000 people on the Facebook page. And the way I remember it, it was like 20 or 30 people on a forum who were posting every day. And I think that's what you and I were yeah. used to, uh, in the early days. Yeah. yeah it's crazy. Uh, I think, I think when we were on it, it, like you say, it was the same people every day talking to each other. It was, it was a bit more of like a sort of a, I, I don't know, a group of friends. Um, yeah. But, but now it's 15,000 people and uh, 15,000 people who are, have the same interests. It's cool. Um, yeah. And I mean, I think for me, it was something that was a really special experience because I was about 16 again when I first discovered the AVA movement and when Neighborhoods and Love Part 2 came out. And that was really my introduction to Tom DeLonge. I mean, you know, we've all heard all the small things, you know, <laughs> since we were probably in kinder. Well, I guess people, I'm young comparatively <laughs> now, but like, you know, I remember growing up with that song and, and hearing it on the radio and it was, you know, it was a pop song. I didn't care about the artist behind it. I didn't care about the pop punk movement. It was just my parents, you know, didn't let me listen to anything that wasn't Christian music. But but once I got into Angels and Airwaves, it just hit me at the right time of my life where kind of Tom's message and Tom's songwriting sensibilities just clicked with where I was as an adolescent. And But none of my friends were really into Blank or Angels and Airwaves. It wasn't really kind of radio music or something that kids in the late 2000s were really into. Um, so for me, going to the AVA movement, there were people who were extremely read into uh, the music and, and what Tom was. They knew all these stories behind the band and it was also a place to discuss all the other stuff Tom was doing with movies or, or what would turn into to books and comics. And that was something that, you know, again, it was very small. It was just like a dozen people or two dozen people at first, but like that has become something has become a much bigger canvas. You know, we're, we're on a platform where hundreds of people can weigh in on a certain post. And what's cool is everyone's equally passionate. So it's like, I've actually not just, you know, had my own experience growing up with Tom's music, but also grown up talking to other people who are equally passionate and watching that community slowly get bigger and bigger and bigger uh, to the point or where we are today and where the band might be doing stadium tours next year. And that's just tremendously satisfying being such a fan and, 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 you know, being so passionate about what Tom has done with angels and airways and with all of his music endeavors. Yeah. I think what's, um, what's quite interesting is that it's not as if there's only been like 20 fans. There's always been lots and lots of fans, but they are an interesting band. They are a very sort of 
niche band i would say compared to blink 182 um when we when the facebook group started up i think it was really nice to see more than just the the 15 20 of us just sitting chatting about it because it was hard to find people who who were interested in in the band and like i say it's not to say that uh the band didn't have any fans it's just that they were sort of they didn't know any they didn't know about the ave movement so I think Facebook, the Facebook groups really helped lift that. What I think is really interesting about Angels and Airwaves as an entity is the fact that while people know of their music or know of their singles, like I'm pretty sure a lot of people we know have heard like Surrender on the radio, or maybe they've heard The Adventure, Everything's Magic, Secret Crowds, but they're not really aware of the kinds of albums they release and how it's multi-platformal, how there are also, you know, movies or music videos or short films or books or, or graphic novels. And it's also something where most people might enjoy the music. Like I think Angels and Areas makes very sonically pleasing music, but not a lot of people are rushing to be a part of like the community and being a part of like, like even when Mod Life was around early on in Angels and Airways run, like that was a small group of people. And what was great about the community was it was really, really tightly knit. And the people who were there, you really got along with just because it's like you're on their wavelength. If you're on Tom's wavelength and on the wavelength of his art, the people who tune into his wavelength are also on your wavelength. And I think, you know, that's something that's really cool. But I used to think they were super niche. Like Tom would always say, oh, we want to be in stadiums. You know, we want to be, you know, the greatest rock and roll revolution in the past two decades. And like, it, I was always like somewhat disappointed that the community was always so small, even though, you know, I love talking with you guys and everyone had a great relationship. It was really small. But again, you know, now it's becoming really, really big. And what's cool is I'm constantly meeting people who I am on the same wavelength as. I feel like everyone just views art very similarly and they really, really, really believe in what Tom's doing. And that's just like, it's the gift that keeps on giving. And, and especially as we go into this new era, it, I, I'm really excited to see what happens. Yeah, I think uh, when we were on the forum, when we were on the old forum website, you're right, it was about 15, 20 people just chatting. <laughs> Sometimes it wouldn't even be about angels and areas, and it did become a bit of like a sort of friendship group. But uh, now, you know, you were saying there's 15,000 people on the Facebook group. There is a much bigger community. Uh, it's not as niche as it used to be. I think it used to be seen as... A side project that you weren't really you know you didn't have to really care about but now this is tom's main thing also with to the stars and uh yeah i think a lot of people are starting to really actually see what his vision was for it rather than it just being a sort of side project where he sounds different from what he did in blink 182 or he's maybe showing a different part of his personality like this is this is tom the long this is what he wants to do, and uh, the real the real people who are in that are interested in his music are starting to shine through on this group, and it's really nice. As opposed to, I feel like maybe before sometimes um, people would just be dipping in and out of this band just to see uh, if it sounds like Blink One Eight Two yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think it. You're right. It was viewed critically and by his fan base as something that was more of a vanity project. Or, you know, something where it's like, oh, you know, Tom has to go off and do his own thing and make pretentious art. or But something it was something that wasn't to be taken too seriously. And, you know, since the beginning, Tom has been saying, no, 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 this isn't this isn't my side project. This isn't me like messing around like this is really who I am. Like this is who I am as an adult and this is what I want to bring artistically. And I mean, I believe that from early on, but it was weird because, you know, a lot of critical websites and music reviewers and a lot of Blink, uh, a lot of Blink fans would really – kind of rip into him but i think you know now that he has detached from blink you know blink has been able to go the direction that mark and travis i think really wanted to go and then angels and areas has really become tom's focus where he's putting all his ideas into and it's something that is now i think being taken more seriously and it did take some time to build up the infrastructure to do even a lot of like the companion pieces um, to, you know, to create to the stars and to get publishers on board and, and writers and to start getting uh, production companies in Hollywood involved in some of the stuff they're producing. But it's it's finally starting to happen. And on that note, I feel like this is also the perfect time to ask you what made Tom's music and Tom's art so important to you that you sought out being a part of like an online community? Yeah, uh, 
I was a Blink-182 fan. I still am a Blink-182 fan at heart. Um, not a big fan of the new music, but that's a discussion for another day, maybe. <laughs> um, I think what really brung me into the Ava movement is that I was looking for uh, a community that I could talk with. I didn't really have a lot of friends that were in Angels and Airwaves. I had friends that knew of Angels and Airwaves, and maybe they didn't want to talk about it. Maybe they didn't think it was cool, or, you know, there's so many different things that they maybe didn't <laughs> like about it. But uh, I I just really wanted to talk about it, and I was really starting to become um, my own sort of musician, uh, rather than just sitting in my room playing guitar to Blink-182 or Green Day. or I was starting to become sort of like what my my own personality for music and i liked what tom was doing because he was shining his own personality for music i kind of resonated with that a little bit um when they brung out the we don't need to whisper uh documentary um start the machine oh uh, i think just seeing the clips of him recording music in his own home just like really getting into the vibes of things and stuff it just made me really want to do that too and i wondered at the time if there was people that felt the same way i did so I think that's what brought me into the Ava movement. Really, I just wanted to. I just wanted to chat. I wanted to see what other people thought. I wanted to, you know, debate. Really, uh, get to know people that had sort of similar interests to me. Because, like I said, there was no one really in my friend group that had that sort of the sort of interest that I did. Yeah, and I, I like the fact that you brought up the Start the Machine documentary because, like, right after I bought Neighborhoods and Love Part 2, I just remember thinking I need to know everything that I can possibly know about this band. Like, I need to go down all the Wikipedia rabbit holes and watch all the old YouTube videos, and, and I was just – wanted to immerse myself in this world. And even, I think, before I registered an account in the AVA movement, I found the Start the Machine documentary on YouTube – and I mean, you know, like we had talked about earlier, I was somewhat familiar with Blink and Tom DeLonge, but to see like someone just go down this rabbit hole and so immerse themselves in art, but also art that was very expansive, you know, it's like he's in this small room, he's in the guest room of his house, but the music is telling a story that feels like it's happening on a galactic canvas. And then, you know, the documentary had all those animations and little artistic flares to it to kind of you know, kind of uh, synergize and harmonize with what you were seeing unfold in the recording process. And I mean, for me, that was just, that was where it really clicked. And I also saw the love movie as well. And um, was also like, how are they doing this? Like, like for me, artists, you know, you had to be a musician, you had a tour and make an album every year and you're on a label. And like, if you're a musician, that was your thing. That was all you could be. And if you were a filmmaker, which I was also interested in, you know, you got to go to film school. You got to just immerse yourself in this. You can't do anything else. You know, don't fiddle around with another art form. If you're a filmmaker, like you, you should know your boundaries. And Tom was someone who said, no, fuck the boundaries. I don't have boundaries. It's like, I'm going to express myself in whatever medium I feel is best suited to the ideas and inspirations I have. And of course that's difficult to achieve uh, on a production level, even for someone with the resources of Tom. But the fact that someone out there, someone out there in the artistic community was trying this, that to me was like, this is where I need to be. These are the kinds of people I need to hang out with and, and learn from. And I almost became like a disciple of the art, not so much the person, but of the artistic ambition of angels and airwaves and kind of the, the, uh, collaborators of angels and airwaves and i mean that that's probably the best explanation for me of why the ava movement uh is so important to me as a community and something i still to this day even as i'm you know <laughs> rocketing through my 20s way faster than i thought i ever would you know it's something that i, I still check in with on a, on a weekly and, and monthly basis even if there's nothing going on of course yeah it's just uh it's more than just a band now it feels like it's an actual community of people who keep in touch with each other even if there is 15,000 of them, you know, you start, there is a lot of standout people who are starting to become bigger parts of the community and you see the way that they're getting on through life and how Angels and Aries has influenced them and affected them. It's nice. Yeah, you're totally right. And I think um, the fact that the community has gotten so big is is why I think it's the perfect time to do this podcast and to reboot the podcast. I know there were a few episodes that that had been recorded way in the past but it was it's not something that's still available so for all intents and purposes what what we're doing right now is the first episode of the AVA movement podcast and i mean it's it's something that i feel very passionate about because i feel like it's something that has to happen now like tom has been very clear 
uh, in the past few months saying like, we have a, you know, 18 to 24 month plan of what we're going to do. You know, they, they released a single and a video, then they're going to do a tour. Then he's going to go off and direct the strange times slash monsters of California movie. Then they're going to do more touring. Then they have to score the movie, record the rest of the album and then release the documentary that Peter McKinnon has done and then do, uh, release the movie and then potentially do a massive stadium tour, something that could be done um, in the US or in North America, but also could be brought to Europe or Asia or somewhere else. So for me, it's like, even though some stuff has already happened, like Angels and Airways was kind of a studio band for a while, um, and you know, Rebel Girl was released, gosh, well, like four or five months ago, we're still just at the very, very beginning of this big uh, strange times chapter, if that's what it's still going to be called. And so for me, it's like, I want to be there for it. Like I want to contribute to the community. I want a platform where other fans can, can come on or, or call into or, or just be a part of. And, and I think like the amount of effort and energy that's being put into this project is worth discussing and worth celebrating and, and worth sharing with other people. And so at least for me, I know that's where is like, I, I reached out to John Marco and I was like, we, we have to do something with a podcast. Cause like the community is there and the discussion is right for the taking yeah absolutely it's the best time to do it uh, like you said there's a new sort of era that uh the band has started up and um i think honestly it's probably going to be the best era the, they have a band again you know it's not just a, a one-man project a two-man project uh, or maybe a project that's putting stuff out but with no sort of focus or aim it's there's a real focus here and um it's nice that the the community is getting so involved and what i think the podcast is maybe going to help do is uh maybe give the community something just to you know something to listen to this so that they actually know that other people are discussing the same things that they're thinking and on that note let's go ahead and discuss the single and the music video for rebel girl So at the end of April of this year, 2019, we finally got what I think was was a real uh, rock single from Angels and Airwaves that was meant to go wide and make an impact. And it's kind of feels like the first time this happened since, I guess, something on Dreamwalker, maybe with like Wolfpack or, or Tunnels, but, but those weren't really radio songs. Like I'm thinking back to like Love Part 2 with Surrender, where it's like, this it's making a statement. It, it's tailored for mass consumption without compromising its artistic uh, quality. And I, I, there was no real lead up to that. No one quite knew when a single was coming out. They knew Tom had been in the studio for quite some time. And just with the release of the Rebel Girl single also came that teaser for the documentary and showing them at the photo shoot and showing them tracking. And all of a sudden, you know, at the end of April, it was like, we're back. It just happened. Yeah. Um, what did what did you think of that? What were your first impressions when the song dropped, especially so suddenly? Uh, what was just your first thoughts? Uh, it caught me off guard. It really caught me off guard. I think I was a bit nervous about seeing that there was a new Angels and Airwaves song because I, I, I don't know. I kind of expected them to go in a direction I didn't want, really personally want them to go in, but Rebel Girl is, is fantastic. Um in just about every way the direction that you didn't want was that something that was like more like a past work like you didn't want them to go more the direction of dreamwalker or you thought it was going to be too electronic like i know you're a musician and you also care very much about the production and the producing of the song so like what was the direction you thought they were going to go and then what's the direction that you liked about rebel girl i was really nervous that it was going to be a love kind of song okay um i know that love is like probably the, the passion project that he really envisioned for Angels and Their Waves. But I feel like they had kind of already done that two albums beforehand anyway. Yeah. Um. So I was kind of worried that, you know, they would have come off of Dreamwalker and there was a bit of a negative reception and it actually probably came from mostly the fans of the first few albums. So when this came out and it's like this perfect sort of combination of the early stuff and the new stuff, it's great it's great um it's 
it's a new sound. It's not a recycled sound, and that's probably what I was most worried about, it being a recycled sound. Yeah, and it's, it's funny. My roommate actually pointed out there's, like, Rebel Girl sounds a bit like some of the stuff that 1975 is doing, but and, and that's true sonically, but what's nice is that I don't feel like Tom is trying to heavily channel like any existing artist. Like he's just trying to take a lot of inspirations and distill it into his punk rock voice. Like, like I know he said in interviews, he's like, I'm trying to take my rock sensibilities and my, my punk rock core, but also sophisticate the way I, I bring a song to life. You know, instead of just like these loud guitars, you're adding synths and you're adding a lot of percussion and, and, um, with, with, someone like Alon Rubin or Aaron Rubin, who's his brother, they're very technically savvy. So they're able to kind of add a lot of genre dimension to something that does have a very simple and energetic core. And and to your point, I think Rebel Girl, I- another iteration of Rebel Girl could have been safe or, or kind of dull or too sentimental, but they managed to get the right tonal balance for this song. And it sounds huge and you want to like jump up and down, but it also isn't over the top which is nice. I think the mix and the producing just landed exactly where it needed to, to make the song the best version of itself, which is just like a simple rock and or simple, like stadium new wave synthy ballad. Right. The, the production, um, the production is great. Actually was really, really refreshing to hear some nice production because I feel like, well, there was a couple of EPs between the Dreamwalker and Rebel Girl, but I feel like the Dreamwalker sounded a little bit muddy here and there, and yeah. maybe that was the direction that they wanted, um, which is fine, absolutely fine. Um, but you know, a really sort of crisp and clear production would have really, really helped bring that album to where it should have been. Love Part Two, yeah, the production was okay, um, but the first three albums really, really hit the nail on the head for production, and Rebel Girls right up there with it. I think Iron Rubin has done a fantastic job this time around, to be honest with you. When you listen to it, it sounds more of like a, a joint effort and not uh, uh, Tom's uh, influence is here, Alan's influence is here, and then they've sent it off to Iron and Iron's influence is here, you know? It yeah. just it sounds like a joint effort and it's really nice to listen to. I actually, I mean, I really do like the Dreamwalker, but I agree with you that it sounded a little a little dirty and, and something where, it, you know, Tom and, and Alon were very honest about the fact that they struggled to to coalesce into one style. And, and I think, you know, that's reflected in varying degrees of success. Like, I think some songs on Dreamwalker are a perfect medley of all the styles and some still feels like there's a war going on within the song of what different people want it to be who are, who are trying their best to contribute to a greater whole, but, but it, there's still a struggle in it. And like the of nightmares EP swung very, very hard in the Rubens direction. Um, I think feel like Tom just kind of like stepped out completely uh, except for like writing lyrics and, 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 you know, overseeing some of the producing and the direction, um, like all the individual tones and tracks were, were very new regime style, which was also, you know, again, I, I, fr- I really actually love the Rubens. I think Aaron Rubin is tremendously talented, so it's nothing against them. I was just kind of taken off guard because th- that was scoring the poet Anderson concept and, and there was a, a companion piece to the novel, but again, like what I've also loved about Tom in the time from between, uh, love part two and, and present is that no two projects have ever had the same sound musically. Like the demos album sounds completely different than the Dreamwalker, despite the fact that they were recorded back to back. And, you know, Chasing Shadows EP sounds nothing like the Of Nightmares EP, which sounds nothing like the Acoustic EP. So each time something's coming out, these guys are saying, let's, let's you know, pick a different set of sonics or a different set of textures or a different kind of songwriting or a different, different lyrical tint. And I mean... Like you, I was kind of a little surprised by Rebel Girl, but I also wasn't surprised because if you look at the trajectory, they're always changing their sound and they're, 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 what do we want to write in this moment or what inspires us right now? Um, you know, personally, I really like that because even if you don't like every release, the art will always stay fresh. Yeah. And I think, I mean, we, we've only heard one song from the album. I think if there's anyone out there that, that doesn't like the way Rebel Girl sounds right now, um, don't be too quick to judge. Obviously, it sucks if you don't like it, but there's still plenty more to come out. They put a teaser out for a tour video, um, which sounds really, really promising. It sounds 
uh, this probably contradicts what I said earlier, but it sounds like love. <laughs> but I mean, there's nothing wrong with like dipping in to to different your old past influences as long as it's you know you've got this consistent new style going on. Then yeah, absolutely go for it. I think I think the synths that we've heard from Kiss and Tell, I think that's what the song is called. God, you know, if I got it wrong, that's terrible because it's gonna be on tape forever. So let's just yeah. let's just say the tour video song slash possibly the second single. Um, the textures or, or the songwriting and the the notes feel very Tom DeLonge, but the textures don't feel like something Critter would have cooked up, you know. So it, it, or Tom would have cooked up, you know, several years ago. So it's like if we get some retro throwbacks, it's not like they're just gonna be. It's not like you can just slot them into the love playlist and they'll sound the same. Like they will still sound like an evolution. Yeah, I think uh, it's actually pretty interesting to hear that sort of stuff because I know it lands really. Um He's really into sort of synthesizers and how he's building layers with synthesizers. It's really interesting hearing that sort of old sound, but it lands influence in the, on that old, old sound. Right. Uh, I think that's what people were maybe expecting when he first joined the band uh, after Atom left. Yeah, me. That was me. I was completely taken off guard by the Dreamworker. I was expecting music more like the kind of the clips or the single we've gotten right now. Right, so maybe this is what people, the people wanted. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not. We'll never know until the album comes out, right? But, <laughs> and I mean, one of my favorite parts of of Tom's artistic approach is that he knows his limitations. Um, you know, he knows his strengths, but he also knows where he can become redundant. Like he even said, like I was so sick of myself or so sick of my own vices after doing Love Part Two. What Tom has said recently is that. Look, I've always wanted to do something with angels and airwaves that I know I can't do myself. Like, I know I can guide the band the right direction. I can provide the songwriting inspiration and some of the oversight, but I, I can't be the guy who's programming all these layers. Or I'm just not that technically savvy. So I think Tom's quest with Angels and Airways has always been to surround himself with the right artists who can who can complement his skill set. But and and contribute to a greater vibe. You know, the song takes on its own energy. It's not Tom's song. It's not a lawn song. It's something they're all feeding their abilities into to create a bigger whole. And I feel like it took a while. And you know, Tom has gone through a lot of creative collaborators, music or otherwise. But I think, and he said in recent interviews, like this is it. Like this is where I think my vision for the band really takes flight. And that's just tremendously exciting. I, I it really feels like Rebel Girl is just the beginning of what we're gonna see. Absolutely. I kind of think that Tom has this habit of taking on what a lot of people are maybe saying on social media or just in the media about his maybe his sound becoming a bit stale. Maybe he takes it a bit too much to heart because I I do actually remember him saying that you know he's starting to he's starting to hate his sound, and I feel like maybe that's he's picked up on a comment somewhere or like some sort of social media thing. And yeah, I kind of feel sorry for him in that state. In that state, because yeah. it's it's difficult to get out of a like if you're stuck with a sound, it's difficult to get out of it. And having to force yourself out of a sound, obviously, was the was the product of the Dreamwalker. And yeah, they they went through a few trials with it with the Dreamwalker, him and Alan. And I think what's good about Rebel Girl is that it sounds like they haven't listened to anyone telling them how they should be how they should sound yeah they've just went with what felt right uh, felt like what their natural instinct was to just let's just ra lay down this songwriting there's these recordings and if it sounds bad then it sounds bad but i don't think they ever they ever had that in their head that it was ever going to sound bad because it's, it's it's such a good song it it's got so much build to it yeah it's got so much sort of everything just sits perfect with it personally I personally feel everything just sits perfect with it. Yeah, I think Thomas said recently, I'm making music again for myself. You know, this isn't because I feel like I have to. A music has to come out with a book or, you know, it's time to make an album again because the record label says so or because it's what I feel like I need to do. You know, he's, he's had a big break from Angels and Airwaves and he's, he's changed a lot as a person. A lot of things have happened in his life since you know, seven years ago. Um, so for him, this is like, I think he's able to bring a lot of life experience and, and things he wants to say. And I think like nothing has more potential than a talented artist who really wants to say something, you know, who's not making art for an arbitrary sense or because he have to, but because it's like, I have to say this right now or I'm going to go crazy. 
Um, and, and that's where we're at. So it's just, it's, you know, he's doing the music for the right reasons. And I think that's showing. Yeah. So now that we've talked about the single, let's go ahead and talk about the music video. Um, at the time we're recording this, the music video just dropped, I think like two days ago. So it's still very fresh. Um, I'd love to get your take on it. Cause I was very surprised. It was not the music video that I expected. And I, I'm curious, you know, being a, a legacy angels and airways fan, what, what you thought of it. So I've watched it a couple times. I think the first time I was probably just excited to see a music video. It's been so long. So there's been a, quite a lot of sort of fan comments about how they don't really understand some certain aspects of it. And that's fine. I think some things could have been done a little better, specifically the part where, uh, the character's name's Tommy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when Tommy starts hitting himself, uh, I think maybe that's just that. Uh, maybe that's just the sense of humor being applied to it. But I feel like maybe like trashing the room or doing something a bit more destructive would have been a bit more of an impact with it, really, rather than a sort of a comedic effect. Maybe that's what they were going for, the comedy effect, which is fine. Uh, personally, probably would have you know had them sort of doing the sort of punk rock thing or like smashing tvs or <laughs> like new stuff world about, stuff you know? yeah 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 absolutely uh other than that though the the band performance parts actually look really nice maybe a bit too dark i would have liked to seen their their faces yeah but yeah it's cool it's cool yeah i mean going off what you said about the band performance that to me was the strength of the video i mean seeing seeing the set they shot on and even just seeing the teaser shots before we actually knew the video had like a narrative component um, I was completely psyched because it felt a bit like the kind of uh, scope of what we got in love with music videos like, you know, hallucinations or or anxiety, but also a little bit more sophisticated and well honed. And that delivered. That really delivered. And I thought the band brought a lot of energy. Seeing David Kennedy rock out with a guitar again was like the most heartwarming moment. I think he's the coolest guy. And to see him back with the band, all of them having fun. Elan just seemed more comfortable with the band, you know, even just performing in the music videos. That all worked really well. I actually wish there was more performance footage, even with a narrative component. I think there was a deficiency of performance footage, which really bummed me out. Yeah. I mean, really, there's a lot of a lot of shots go by without ever cutting back to the band. Um, but I'm also trying to not let my fan bias get in the way. Of course, there's a part of me that's like, I just want to like, just want you to set a camera up and watch these guys play music for like hours. You know, that's like, that's like the fan inside of me. But yeah, the band part didn't disappoint. I, I think I, I was not a huge fan of the narrative component. I thought it was a little tonally dissonant. I thought it had some kind of dark connotations that weren't really thought through. Um, you know, with the characters and with the guy and, and his rage and stuff. I, 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 some people are really angry. I've seen some like news articles pop up online, like this new Angels and Airwaves is a Angels and Airwaves video is a celebration of incel culture, and I'm like, I'm like, all right, like let's pump the brakes here. Like you got to think about who Tom DeLonge is and the energy behind his music and what he's trying to say, even if he's not directing the video. And I think if you know that, it's like, okay, the guy is just a lost romantic, but it's not portrayed well in this video you know what i'm saying it's not some in my opinion it's not portrayed in a way that tonally gels with the song and it's also not independently even if you put the volume on mute it's not something that's done i think to the best of its potential now however i think the video the production design the lighting the color palette uh some of the shots and a lot of the editing was really really good and that that did match the song so i am of two minds like i think i saw what they were going for and of course, it's great to see another proper, properly budgeted Angels and Airways video hit the internet again. Um, at the same time, there was just some stuff that's like a little off with me, but that's not for, you know, that's just me. Like, I don't think it did anything like objectively wrong that I have to go write a BuzzFeed article about, you know, I just felt like it just didn't quite land like it should have. I think there's a, this might be me nitpicking a little bit. Sure. I can't stand it when they do this in music videos, but when they had uh when he was reading out the letter or she was reading out the letter uh over the bridge of the song yeah uh that to me is the best part of the song so for them to fade it out and have someone just like speaking over it i was just sort of like ah oh, i mean I, I get why they have to do it but not right now you know like maybe put a pause in the song or something something yeah it's not this were there any other elements that stuck out to you as something you really liked or didn't like, like whether the way that it was designed or color graded or any of like the technical components or the editing? I'm just curious to get your take on that. 
so the the narrative part kind of reminded me of like a sort of like a Netflix sort of you know you know the the sort of things that Netflix are putting out right now the high school uh coming of age tales like rom-com yeah, super sentimental yeah. stuff yeah it kind of reminded me of that and I I'm not sure if that's maybe what they were going with Rebel Girl I feel like they were maybe just trying to trying to keep up or maybe just trying to do something quick I it it is by no means bad. I actually, <laughs> it sounds like I don't like the video. I actually do really like the video. Yeah. But like I said, the the narrative parts are just a bit, not quite there, and the 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 violent parts as well. Uh, didn't really feel like the were built. That didn't really feel like there was much build to that. It felt <laughs> really out of the blue, which <laughs> which is probably actually a good word explaining Tom DeLonge's quite out the blue, right? It's <laughs> nothing really built. It's just sort of like, all right, cool. So he's funding a spaceship now, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I think there was an attempt to tell something that was universal and relatable, like something every guy or even girl has been through. Now, I got to be clear, that's the first part of the video, where it's something that's like you get to hang out with someone that you really feel for that doesn't feel the same way, and what's that like, and you know, how does the song reflect that? Like you said, as the video goes on, as it gets more intense and the guy essentially resorts to self-harming, but in like a hyper-stylized Quentin Tarantino sense, like, oh, it's something yeah. that is a bold and visceral decision. Um, and then it kind of like, it almost contradicts this idea that you're telling a universal story of unrequited love versus like a very weirdly specific story of like a guy losing his shit <laughs> in like a, in a self-violent way. Um, it is visceral. I got a reaction out of it. You know, it's like, I, and I, I do think there was some awareness. Like, I think this was a creative choice. Like I talked with some people and was like, is this video just tone deaf? And it's like, no, I, I feel like everyone sat around the editing monitor and was like, okay, this is what we're going to do. And it's a, whether it lands or not, like this is the video we want to put out into the world. Um, I don't feel like, you know, someone else shot it and Tom just didn't care about how it turned out. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a reminder that not everyone, and you know, and especially not you and I, are always going to love everything that somebody puts out. And like, I feel like it's okay to say that. Like, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to the artists involved. Like, it's something where it just didn't resonate with me, and I don't want to have to grade Angels and Arrows on a curve just because I have such a history with a band. Like, I will say, like, this is, you know, this this is not landing for me. But that's just me personally, and it seems like a ton of people enjoy it. You enjoy it, and that's great. I'm sure I will very much enjoy the next one. So before we wrap up the main discussion, I wanted to just take a minute to play a small excerpt from a recent interview that Tom did about the where he, where he discussed briefly the new album and what it was going to be like thematically. Angels and Airwaves is pretty well known for having themes drive their albums or their multi-platform projects, and I thought Tom had like a really interesting answer for what this next album is going to be about. So uh, we're going to go ahead and play the clip from that interview, and then we're going to talk about it afterwards. So there's many themes uh, when Angels and Airways does one of its projects, you know, we did one on consciousness and we did one on, um, you know, changing the way you view yourself in the world. We did one on having a rebirth of your own soul. You know, we, we try to tackle these big themes around, you know, humanity. But the new one is very much about wonder. Uh, the movie um, is really thematically about coming of age and realizing that there's so much more to existence than what you're told. You don't need to go to college and have a nine to five job and be a robot. Um, the universe is a magical place. There's much more to human life than we understand and that we know. And we should engage that and we should dive in head first and find out m more about the universe and everything that it encompasses and not get so stuck in our earthly life where we're in traffic every day and we got to pay our taxes and we got to hate other countries because they look different than us or they believe different things. I think, uh, you know, the study that I'm doing on this record in this movie is really about how fascinating um, human life is from a supernatural perspective um, because it's not really paranormal. It's just physics that we don't totally understand yet. Um, and my goal is to get people interested in those things. 
So that was Tom in an interview with uh, 98.7 FM's YouTube channel last month. Uh, it was published July 24th, so it's pretty recent. Uh, we know at this point in the process, Angels and Airwaves has recorded about half of what this next album is going to be, and they're waiting uh, for Tom to direct the movie and then get into post-production and edit the movie and then score the movie, and then that score is going to apparently influence or kind of work together with the remaining half of the album. Um, so this is a comment that's being given about halfway through the recording process, um, and then also, you know, this was an answer that was given after Rebel Girl has come out. So, uh, Stephen, what are your just initial reactions to him dropping that nugget about the theme, which I don't think we've heard at all before? I think it actually kind of uh, makes sense with... It's exactly what I was just saying about Rebel Girl. It sounds like he's uh, maybe looking back on a past experience and uh, he's grown up and, you know, he's grown up because of these past experiences. Like he was just saying, it's about wonder, it's about, you know becoming a better human being rebel girl makes a lot of sense in that sort of context you know it's you look back in the lyrics and it's all about this experience of how he's sort of uh he's been in love and maybe the it's not worked out for whatever reason and uh this is him growing up because of it yeah and it's interesting that that you say that because i i i totally see that but i have a bit of a different take on, oh, yeah. on where that's coming from. I mean, with, with Rebel Girl, definitely, it is kind of like a throwback song. But, you know, just given Tom's massive odyssey that he took um, with the unidentified aerial phenomenon and assembling the government team or the ex-government team to create to the Stars Academy of Arts and Science, I mean, not only has this guy lived a rock star life where he's toured the world and, you know, sold 30 or 40 million albums with Blink and played in stadiums for entire tours. Like, that's a massive adventure in and of itself. This guy has also become, you know, a pioneer or the vanguard of a cultural phenomenon uh, of, you know, destigmatizing and and researching in a scholarly sense this cultural phenomenon that has been a passion of his since he was like 14. You know, when he got his first computer, he like just looked at UFOs. That's like a story he likes to tell a lot. So while this album, I don't think will be like chasing shadows in the sense that like a lot of the imagery used or a lot of the, the, the lyrics kind of revolve around like, like war and technology and, and, and that kind of stuff. I think it's, it's not going to take those direct cues, but it will take the kind of, feeling you know it's going to capture the emotion of just discovering the magic of the reality we live in and you know while it can be very dark and scary we got that in neighborhoods you know they sang about a dark and scary world there in this album we're going to be hearing about possibility and i think tom is someone who when he feels something he's able to transcribe it into music very well so i think he's going to take like the last three or four years of what he's been feeling and just channel it right into all this music and i think what he's feeling right now is is an awe you know an awe of the world around him because of all these experiences and like that's part of the reason why i do think this might be their best work yet because like i want to know what he feels like like i want to get that feeling in music and i think that's what he's going for it does sound like it's sort of personal experiences maybe he's talking from a personal level whereas the, dr the dreamwalker sort of felt like he was telling a story yeah. Love Part 2 sort of felt like he was telling a story or telling people how how these feelings feel. <laughs> right. You know? But with this, it feels like a personal thing, and that's what he does best. When you look back to the self-titled record, he had so many different feelings about so many different things, and that's what really brought that record out, and that's what really made it such a classic record. People resonate with it. And I feel like people are going to resonate with this new music as well. Absolutely. Yeah. He's been saying like on Instagram, like I have so many things that I, I want to feel, you know, I have so many feelings I want to sing about. And, you know, like you said, that's when we got self-titled. That's also, I think when we got Boxcar, um, that's when Tom's at his best and, and Dreamwalker, which by the way, I really do like, it's a very intellectual album. You know, it's like him and Alon sitting down, like thinking, how can we sophisticate our songwriting and how can we sophisticate the sound? And you know, for some people, that's that's what they're here for. They just love the sophistication of that record. For me, I'm more about just the instinctual emotion that Tom seems to be able to channel into his art. So yeah, maybe we'll get, you know, Angels and Airwaves version of the Untitled record. Yeah, hopefully we get the, the Angels and Airwaves version of the Untitled record. 
maybe maybe we'll get another we don't need to whisper with a with a more modern sound um because even that that would be perfect and we'd be i i feel like we don't need to whisper fits in with the modern sound anyway but with the new angels and the airwave sound if they just kind of like added on to that and all the sort of themes about the lyrics or you know any part of these you know parts of songs that that Tom's grown up with um it would just be really interesting to see how much he's changed like sort of like as a personality how much he, his feelings change and you know he's been in contact with so many different government officials it'd just be really interesting to see how that comes across in song form certainly so so looking forward uh for this specific podcast i think we're we're looking to do this about once a month. I feel like every month or so is kind of a, a, a good mile marker to hit when tracking this next two year odyssey of the band. I mean, you know, they'll be they'll be doing some promo tours. I'd I'd love to talk a bit about actually seeing them on stage again and what the, the you know tour design is like, what they sound like, um, what the tone of the shows are. Um, specifically, next time we're going to come back in September and we're going to discuss the second single, uh, which hopefully, again, is hopefully the one from the tour video. I think it's called Kiss and Tell, according to Shazam. Um, and then also by the time we record the second episode, they're going to be probably midway through their promo tour of North America. So we're going to have seen interviews or watched videos from the show. We're also going to dive into that a little bit in the second show. So in the spirit of uh, the podcast being a, a democratized platform for the AVA movement community, we'd like to hear from you about your thoughts on the, on the second single. So once the single comes out and once Angels and Airways starts touring again, if you see some of the videos or perhaps you're at one of the early live shows, um, if you could just record us a quick about 60 second, 60 to 90 second voicemail and send it to uh, uh, the email. We're going to have that in the description. We're going to be posting it on the AVA movement social media platforms. Just go ahead and send us an MP3, an audio recording. You can even do it on your phone or if you have a USB microphone, whatever works for you. Just get us a message about what you think of the second single and also what your experience or perspective is like on the shows they're playing in this promo tour. And we'll play as many of those clips as we can and we'll probably play them all together and then have a discussion based off your thoughts. Um, and so there'll be more information and more updates as we go along. And if you can get that into us early September, early to mid September, we'll be able to feature it on the new show. Any thoughts from you, Stephen, final thoughts just about podcast or, or where Angels and Airways is going as a whole? I think it's, it's going to be an exciting time, isn't it? It's going to be a really exciting time for not just the fans, but maybe, you know, people who are interested in Blink, people who are interested into the stars, you know, Tom's finally back to doing his best and the podcast is up and going. Uh, we'd love to get more people involved. So yes, yeah, send in your MP3s. It'd be great. So uh, join us next time when we come back for our second episode in September and leave us a comment as well on uh, the YouTube comments or tag AVA Movement on Twitter or Instagram or visit our Facebook page and group and let us know what you thought of the show. Maybe something you want to hear us also discuss in the second episode of the podcast and maybe even just what your thoughts are about what we discussed and, and what, what if you liked Rebel Girl or not and your thoughts on this new era of Angels and Airwaves. Um, in the meantime, my name is Adam Barnard. And my name is Stephen Christie. And we'll see you next time.